So we did Art in the Romantic Era. I'm Matthew Baird. I'm Trey Fernandez. I'm Teague Weeby. And Allison Hogan. And we're going to start off with doing uh, Sunday Morning on the Island of La Grande Jatte by Surratt. Um, so this is really starting to make a, a statement about the upper middle class. If you look at the people in the paintings, all of them are very stiff and upright. None of them really look exactly real. Um, this is to say that the middle class, even though they are wealthy and they have free time, they're so caught up with uh, looking like the upper class, they can't have fun. So even though it's a Sunday morning in the park and everyone's supposed to be having fun, they're all looking in the, uh, away from each other. No one's interacting. No one's really moving at all. It seems really unreal. In fact, if you look, uh, the worker and the moving child in the background are the only ones who look like real human beings. Here's a picture of the stiff upper body. What's really interesting about this is, this is actually in the middle of the piece, and you can see that the mother and the daughter, even though it kind of looks as though they might be holding hands, the daughter's actually not even close to the mother at all, in fact in front of the mother, and seeming to walk right out of the page. Here's the worker. And he's the, really the only one who looks realistic in this whole entire painting. He's slouched over, he's actually relaxing. And actually, when you look at the painting close up, uh, he looks huge, larger than life. And I've actually seen this painting before in Chicago. Here's a picture of the little girl, and she's the only motion in this whole entire painting here. And that's to say that she and the worker are really the only ones who actually have any idea of how to have fun. So this was started in 1884 and finally finished in 1886. Um, at first he started out Surat, uh, started out with brush strokes and then began incorporating uh, pointillism. So he just took a little paintbrush and did little points and this was to get a wider variety of shade. The last thing he did was to paint a border of red with dots on it. So here's the pointillism and the red border. Now this was actually a huge project it stands about 7 feet tall and about 11 feet across. And when you're actually walking into the uh, Chicago Art Museum, they first present you with a whole bunch of little bird paintings. Then you walk into the room and you see this guy. So here's Howie uh, standing next to this giant painting. And it's really very pretty. The Palais Garnier is the 13th theater to house the Paris Opera since it was founded by Louis XIV in 1669. A competition was created to find a builder with enough skill to create such a spectacular building and was won by Charles Garnier, a 35-year-old architect. It took 15 years from 1860 to 1875 to build the Opera House. Garnier blended classical Greek and Roman styles with the Baroque architectural spirit in his design of the Opera House. Notice the keystone arches to add support, while still allowing air to flow through. The proscenium theater allows the audience to focus on the stage. The Corinthian columns add a dramatic touch to the theater, as well as adding support to hold the building up. The four sections of the painted ceiling depict different allegories of music. The venue was intended to host the festivities of the emperor's entourage and of elegant audiences from the social elite for whom a night at the opera was a pleasant excuse for meeting people and renewing acquaintances. For this reason, the passages, halls, foyers, staircases, and rotundas occupy a far larger area than the theater itself. This draws attention and allows people to come together. Frederick Chopin, known as the king of romantic period, made a lot of piano pieces. He has made over 200 piano compositions, which demonstrate his highly individual melodic style. Waltz in A minor is one of Chopin's famous pieces that has many different renditions of his song today. Even though being a simple and easy piece of music, there's a sh strong feeling behind this song. Its smooth tempo will relax your soul with its mood changing between Happy, happy and sad. The triplets in this piece usually set the happy, the happy mood, whereas when this piece hits the lower notes, it becomes more of a mysterious and sad mood. Giselle 
originally choreographed by Jean Corrali, Jules Perrault, and Mario Patipa, premiered in 1841 in Paris, and it's a staple of the romantic genre of ballet. It's about a girl who falls in love with a guy, but then she finds out he's engaged to someone else, so she dies of a broken heart. And it's very tragic, but a very beautiful ballet. And we're going to look at a couple little parts of this rendition by the Bolshoi Ballet of Moscow. In this part of the ballet, you can clearly see all of the different colors used. The background and the core dancers are in kind of darker, richer colors like red and gold, whereas the um, principal ballerina is in lighter colors like white and blue. And then later in the ballet, in this part where she's doing the hops on point across the stage, are very interesting because of the repetition of the hopping and then the ornamentation of the leg moving from extension back to passe as she's moving. And here you see another ballerina and the principal male dancer coming to do their pas de deux. And you see in these cabrioles the repetition as they're moving across the stage. We're now going to talk about the comparison between the, uh, these four different pieces. First we're going to talk about the line and symmetry between all of them. So in the painting you can definitely see that there's the straight backs and the straight lines that you can uh, are in all the uh, middle upper middle class. And you can also see that there's the one exception to this is the horizontal line of the worker who's actually laying down. And that kind of juxtaposition between horizontal and vertical lines gives you an idea of the feeling between the two uh, groups of characters. Um, in the ballet, you can see that everything is upright and flowing. Um, and then you can see that there's a delicate nature of the opera stage. And the line itself, even with the, if you look at, especially at the curtains, you can see that there's the swooping curtain, or it's actually a painted curtain, the swooping painted curtain that is, even though it's magnificent and huge, it still looks slightly delicate because of the horizontal and vertical lines. Chopin also has a smooth melodic line, but still has the same the same line of symmetry going through the whole entire piece. As far as repetition is concerned, Seurat uh, has everyone looking forward without emotion. In the ballet, the repetitive movements and phrases in the choreography for the opera house has repetition of, uh, in the columns, the boxes, and the seats, and etc. And for Chopin, there's a repetitive waltz rhythm and motif. So here we have the line in symmetry. First looking at the opera house, you can see the obvious symmetry between the two sides and the strong vertical and horizontal lines. In the ballet, the same. And then here you can also see in Surat the different types of mostly vertical symmetry here. And then Chopin was kind of hard to uh, put into picture form, so we just kind of you have to remember the melodic lines of Chopin. Here's repetition. Repetition is shown in the painting as every person looks almost the same, with the colors and in the background and the foreground. Repetition in the opera house is shown as the repetition of stairs, chandeliers, and paintings. Repetition in the ballet would be the repetition of movement and postures and the costumes. There you can see a close-up of the opera house as the ceiling shows the repetition of paintings as well as the repetition of the Corinthian columns and the arches. There's a close-up of the ballet and you can see the repetition of all of the dancers in the pose. And there's a Now if we talk about the colors in all these different pieces, you can see that there are some similarities in red and gold coloring. In the opera house, you see in the stage area with the seats and the painted curtain on the stage are all painted red and gold. In the ballet, the costuming in the beginning of the piece and in the core dancers and the set design has a lot of red and gold in it. In Chopin, the dramatic motif with the darker, kind of richer tones feels a little bit like red and gold, just in the richness of it. And it's throughout, everyone's in the sunshine. It's red, it's gold colored. And there are a couple of red accents throughout the piece. You see the opera house with the seats up on the side with the gold and the red, very rich. 
and underneath that in the ballet with her costume and the backdrop and in the Surat with the different red accents throughout the piece. The blue and white, the brighter colors, show the more happier scenes in each the, the ballet, the, the opera house, and this painting. As you can see, the, the light shining through the door in the opera house shows the more happy and kind of like a meeting place for everyone to discuss everything. In the ballet, uh, the, the blue and white background light shine on the dress of this dancer. It represents moonlight at night. In this painting, the light green, the light shades in this painting show the happiness of all the people in this park. And Chopin, uh, towards the end of the piece with the more crystal toned notes, show the happiness of it. So in an overall comparison, but first off, the very obvious one, they were made in the same time period, the 19th century romantic movement. Um, some of the main themes were the lightness of the colors, the lightness of the tones, the different types of movements of the dancers, and the very delicate light touches that you can see in the opera house. We also found that there was a really rich contrast between rich colors and pale tones. This is definitely obvious in the Surat, with the red and the blue seeming to come in between the lake, the grass, and the shaded area. In the opera house, this is also obvious when you there's a distinct difference between the meeting areas and the staircase and the actual opera house itself. The ballet, you can see that in the very beginning of the ballet, things were red and then moved on towards a more blue, cool type of color. And also in the Chopin, where you have interspersing of a very rich melody to a very pale, cool, almost dreamlike melody.